Hey everybody, Dave Hagen here. Today we're finishing our 13 tips or 13 things to think about when you're starting a business. That's today on the Financial Wellness Podcast. Welcome to the Financial Wellness Podcast, Dave's weekly message to keep you on your path to the financial success. Here is your host, financial problem solver and talk show host, Dave Hagan. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of the TFWP. This is episode 419, and we're talking about 13 tips or 13 things you want to think about when you're starting a business. We talked about the first seven tips last week. So this is part two of a two-part series. Nick is out studying for that little quiz they call the bar exam. And with me again this week, Mr. Brian Reed. Howdy, David. How are you? Hey, buddy? Good. Yourself? Doing very well. Well, we're going to reveal a little something here. Uh, are you still up in uh, Seattle? I still am, and um, I have the three most dangerous nephews in the world, so it's awesome being their dark lord and master godfather, <laughs> Uncle Brian. And That's seeing, my full title, by the way. Is that the way it works? That's the way it works. And you've been, you've been going to a lot of ball games, I hear, watching the kids play. A lot of baseball, a lot of soccer happening. It's been a lot of fun. Very cool, very cool. And I'm coming to you from Topanga, as I do so often. And Scott Walton, our engineer, is coming to us from Bakersfield. So that is your crew, and that's where we're coming from. And we are going to talk about more tips for starting a business. Last week, we talked about the fact that I've consulted with thousands of businesses going through difficulties, and I recently put together a presentation for a business class at CSUN, and I looked at the things that I wrote down and went, gosh, this is pretty good. I should share this with the TFW peers. And so that's what we are doing. This is stuff you won't get in a textbook. This is gold. And it's coming from the mind of David Hagen and Brian Reed. So if you don't know what the first seven items are, go back and listen to episode 418. But I'll tell you really quickly what they were. One, understand your motivation. Two, write a business plan. Three, be unique and fill a need. Four, start small, test and listen. Five, choose a proper entity. Six, have a separate bank account for the business, even if you're a sole proprietor. And number seven, a couple of accounting issues. Do your books at least monthly and use QuickBooks. So new for this week, moving on, number eight. Oh, this is big. This is big. I was talking with some people about this just today. Number eight, avoid personal guarantees. Now, if you're a corporate entity and the corporation doesn't make it, the corporation can close. But if you've personally guaranteed obligations, the creditors can come after you individually. So read those documents that you sign, personal guarantees typically, but not always show up at the end of any documents that you sign. Look for personal guarantees. I've seen credit card accounts that were corporate accounts that had personal guarantee language weaved into them. And it created a lot of hardship when the business started so low to slow down. Not only will you see them on, on corporate credit cards, but more often than not, you'll see them on office leases. So if you lease an office, you're going to sign a lease. Make sure you don't sign a personal guarantee. You might not even realize it, frankly, because you're all excited and they go sign here, sign here, sign here. And now you've signed up for 16 years of office space on a business that might only last five years. Ouch. Dave, yeah. do uh, SBAs have personal guarantees? You know, it depends upon each individual loan, but the SBA more often than not tries to get a personal guarantee. And you know what else they love? Collateral. Ooh. So you give them a right to go after assets. And you know what kind of collateral they love to go after? Your Does house. Start 
with an H and rhyme with mouse? It does. It does. Your house. So if you're going to sign an SBA loan that's got a personal guarantee or even worse, you're giving them a lien against your house, think twice. I mean, you should be 95% sure or more that this business idea is sound because otherwise you may end up in bankruptcy. You could end up losing your house. And if you give them a lien on your house, and you end up going through bankruptcy, that lien will still be there when you come out of bankruptcy. You can't even protect yourself from that. So um, look for those guarantees. Look for the fine print. Um, take the time to read it. You know, when someone hands you a big contract, make them sit there while you look at it so you peruse it quickly. Ask questions if there's something that you don't understand. Well, what does it mean that the tenant must have torn? Well, ask that question. You know, the landlord might not even know what it means. Uh, but look at the fine print and spend the time. Don't feel like a jerk for spending the time before you sign it because you're held responsible for what you sign. There are cases in California law that says, hey, if you don't read it and you just sign it, you're still responsible. And if they say, don't worry about it, everybody does it, everybody signs a personal guarantee. Well, not if you listen to the TFWP, because I always tell people, no deal is better than a bad deal. And if they insist upon guarantees, figure out some other way to meet that need for the, the company. Stay away from that stuff. Now, occasionally you can't, you can't get around it, but you need to have some plan in place to deal with that uh, if you've signed that personal guarantee. I think there's a bumper sticker in there, Dave. Spend the time before you sign. Oh, I like that. I like that. Maybe we'll have to make those up and uh, uh, and hand those out to people that call in. Spend the time before you sign. I like that. I had a bumper sticker made up years ago. You know what it said? Oh, no. Debt sucks. <laughs> it's Debt brief sucks. and accurate. I'll give it that. We even had those made into refrigerator magnets one time and I handed them to people and they thought that was funny as hell. But I thought that that was an appropriate, um, you know, statement about it debt. A, it is a truthful statement. Yes. Yeah. Now, pe people, people will say, or advisors will say, well, there's good debt and there's bad debt. No, debt sucks. There might be a few limited times that you take that on. But other than that, debt sucks. But I digress. Avoid those guarantees, read those contracts, and not everybody does it. Even if they print the document up real nice and it looks like an integrated agreement, line something out if you don't like it. If they don't like that, then you don't have to have a deal. You can find some other way to meet that need. Instead of operating out of a, you know, a nice business premises, maybe you'll operate out of a garage and maybe you'll experience the same kind of success that Steve Jobs and Apple or the fellows that started Hewlett Packard um, experienced. By the way, the, the names of the two guys that founded uh, Hewlett Packard, you know who those people were? Uh, Hewlett and Packard. <laughs> that was a trick question. Who's buried in Grant's tomb? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Number nine, number nine. If you have employees, treat and pay them as such. Now, an employee, especially in California, is a pretty complicated and expensive thing to do under uh, the law as it's evolving. But if you have employees, treat them and pay them as such because it's just too dangerous. There's no such thing as under the table. I remember when I was coming up, they go, well, you know, we'll pay you less, but under the table. Well, that just means they're not paying the taxes that they're supposed to pay. And sometimes they want to pay you less than whatever the minimum wage law is. If someone talks about under the table, tell them no thank you under the table or at all. Independent contractors um, have been a big thing over the years, and there's been a lot of information in the, in the press lately and, and court cases, frankly, coming down in California where they were saying, look, this person was an independent contractor. We paid them by the job, not by the hour. They controlled their own circumstances, et cetera, et cetera. And we didn't need to withhold for their taxes. We didn't need to have workers' compensation insurance for them because they're independent contractors. 
And this concept got abused over the years and more and more people, interestingly enough, were treated as independent contractors. Not so much in California anymore. The Supreme Court came down with a case last year and they said, look, we are now going to look at these situations applying the ABC test. And if you, they don't meet that ABC test, they are going to be employees. Basically, the default now is that anyone that works for you is an employee um, and you've got to meet the test uh, to have them dealt with as independent contractors. But the state of California, at least, uh, especially the legislature and the governor, want everybody, if possible, to be employees. Um, and it is really tough and dangerous to treat someone as an independent contractor when they are not. So if local law requires that employees be paid overtime, pay them. Never have skimp on the employee withholding because there's personal liability on some of that withholding. That is, if you have a corporation and you were the person that cut the checks and the taxes were not withheld and forwarded to the government, they turn around and hold you personally liable for that tax because they're saying, hey, you took the money out of that check and you took our money. An employee issue can wipe you out. You have someone talking about um, you know, harassment or wrongful termination or, or what have you, an employee issue can wipe you out unless you have employment practices insurance. Um, and maybe consider using a service. You can pay a service who will bring in their employees and perform those services, and that's fine. Then the, then the independent contractor issue or the employer issue and all the stuff that goes with it is on some um, th third party, some other company. But that starts to get a little pricey. So talk with, um, you know, an attorney that does you know, employment issues, employee, employer issues, set up the required things that you need to do. Make sure that they have, you know, a chart where they, where employees check in and check out, make sure that you comply with all of the federal and state and local requirements. Because if it later turns out, that you didn't, it can be expensive. Now, thinking about this, you also want to think about the fact that you do not want to bring on an employee unless it's absolutely necessary. Do as many of the tasks that you can by yourself, um, you and, and your partner, you and the people that own the business, um, so that you do not have to start bringing in employees and, and be distracted by that and all the things that go along with having employees. When you get larger, you can have an HR department. You can have someone that deals with these issues. I've had a, a, a payroll service that's done the payroll um, for my businesses over the years. And yes, I do pay them every time they cut payroll, but it is worth it to know that it's done and that it's done right. And I never have to think about that. Number 10, don't starve a business. Don't take out every dollar and buy a new car or buy new clothes or whatever. Project what the business needs and reinvest the profits in the business. Don't starve that business because if things start to go south, you're going to have a problem. Take the time to make it grow. You know, for years, Amazon didn't show a profit and people got all upset because they weren't paying taxes. Well, they weren't paying taxes because they weren't showing a profit. Well, how would Amazon not show a profit? Well, they were taking all the money and they were reinvesting it in the business to make the business grow. And then a couple of years ago, Bezos says, well, let's start taking the money out. And because he invested the previous profits in the business, it turns out he can take a lot of money out. In fact, he had to divide up his fortune with his ex-wife, and they're still both on the list of the 20th wealthy people in the world, last I checked. So make the business grow. Leave the money in it. Don't starve out that business. Yes, yes, it's nice to go out and buy a new car when the business starts to do well. Starts, you start doing things like entertaining and doing all these other kinds of things. But uh, leave the money in there. Avoid that impulse to start showing money, spending money, make sure that the business has enough money to be stable and that it has enough money to grow. And by the way, when you start a business, think about 
having enough resources to live without an income for the from the business for a year or so in case things don't t- take off in case a salary is not factored in as part of your business plan um, think about how you're going to support yourself when the business is new and growing number 11 it's not about the gross but the net and boy i learned this this firsthand it's not about what you bring in the door It's about what you put in your pocket. So business expenses are just as important, if not more important, than the gross money coming in the door. I remember I had a business one year, and we were doing okay, but we thought that we would spend some money on advertising. So we spent, now this was some years ago, we spent about $100,000 in advertising. And we worked our tail off with the business and with the new business that was coming in. And at the end of the year, we made about the same money. It's just that the extra money that came in went to pay the advertising company. So it's not about what you make, although that's important. It's about what you net. It's about what you put in your pocket. Number 12, plan and count on success, but have a plan for failure as well. You know, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, about 20% of all new U.S. businesses, small businesses, fail in the first year. One in five failed the first year. And by the end of the fifth year, 50% of those businesses have failed. And after 10 years, only about three out of 10 of those businesses are still around. So plan on having, uh, put together a plan for having failures as well. I remember I I was talking to a client, this was years ago, and they were going to sign a new business lease. And they were pretty comfortable where they were at, but they felt that they were constrained by space. And they were going to sign this new lease, and they brought me in to take a look at it. And the lease had all of these really burdensome clauses in it. And I said to the client, are you really sure? Are you really sure you want to sign this lease? Are you really sure you want to personally guarantee this? And the client said, well, I really have no choice. Well, he did have a choice. No deal is better than a bad deal. And ultimately, that lease led to the demise of that business. So have a plan for failure as well. In fact, when the business fold, I I think everyone associated with the company as ownership ended up um, filing bankruptcy as well. So um, my goodness, plan on success, but have a plan for failure as well. And then number 13, don't be afraid to fold them. So many times I've seen people come in and they've been riding a dead business, riding a dead horse for years. They don't know what else to do. They don't want to lose the money that they've already invested in the business. But sometimes you got to be ready to fold them. And by that, I mean, there was that old Kenny Rogers song, know when to hold them and know when to fold them. And sometimes you need to sit down with your counselors, advisors, professionals and say, look, is it really time to fold this business? Is it really time to go off and do something else? I talked with the business just today, five years, and they're still having profitability issues. And they were starting to fight among themselves and have issues. And and I said, look, I don't I don't want to be the one to bring this up. But is now the time? to really talk about closing this thing out so that y'all can go out and do something else. And we talked about what that might look like. And it was actually uh, very uplifting for them, but you need to not be afraid of folding them if it's just not going to work out. David, have you you heard of the concept of uh, fail fast? Tell me about it. From my understanding of it, it's when, whether it's, you know, in a particular part of a business or the entire business, um, it's a level of honesty amongst those who are responsible for it to have isolated uh, things down to the smallest number of variables as possible and then go, let's test it. Let's test it strong. And if it fails, well, let's fail fast adjust and move on rather than you've got too many variables in play. You don't know what to tweak or not to tweak. And then it's kind of sounds like what you were talking about, which is they're five years in, they're still struggling. 
um, you want to be focused enough so that you are prepared to fail fast with, you know, this arm of the business or this attempt with the business. It's actually a goal. If we're going to fail, you know, we're going to hope for success, plan for success. But if we're going to fail, let's succeed in our failure by failing quickly and quickly identifying what went wrong. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I think that's great advice. You know, when Steve Jobs came back to Apple, they were doing different kinds of computers. They were into printers. They were into monitor. I mean, all of these things. And Steve Jobs got together with everybody and he, he drew an, a line on a, on a whiteboard up and down and across. And he said, upper left-hand corner, this is going to be our personal laptop. And the bottom, this is going to be our personal desktop. Upper right-hand corner, this is our business laptop. Lower right-hand corner, this is our business desktop. And we are only going to focus on these four types of products. And the board of directors said, but my God, we're diversified. We're into printers. And he said, we don't even do that well. Some of this stuff we're just putting our name on and it's crap. It's actually hurting our image. And boy, he had to fight. He had to fight to get them to give up those lines of business. But he forced them to fail sooner. And I, I think that's exactly on point with, with your comments. Fail fast. Fail fast. You know? Um, I, I'd rather see somebody say, well, you know, I probably could have, you know, hung out a little bit longer as opposed to saying, yeah, I, I, I did something different. I turned the corner, got rid of it. Um, and now I'm a lot happier and, and better off. So let's summarize these 13 points from the last two weeks. One, understand your motivation. Number two, write a business plan. Number three, be unique and fill a need. Number four, start small, test, and listen. Number five, choose the appropriate entity. Number six, have a separate bank account for the business, even if you're a sole proprietor. Number seven, do the books monthly and use some program like QuickBooks. Number eight, avoid personal guarantees like the plague. Number nine, if you have employees, treat and pay them as such. Number 10, don't starve your business, leave the money in. Number 11, it's not about the gross, but it's about the net. Number 12, plan and count on success, but have a plan for failure as well. And number 13, don't be afraid to fold them. So this isn't an exclusive list. These are just my thoughts, Brian's thoughts, as we were laying it out. This is just stuff from our playbook, not from a textbook. Hey, stay with us next week. We're going to be talking about the proper etiquette when we talk about money. Have you ever had an uncomfortable conversation about money before, Brian? Um, no, never. Hey, Dave, what's in your wallet? <laughs> I've had what's those uncomfortable conversations. Am, am, all am I crossing time. a line right now? <laughs> what's it worth? How much you got? Um, you know, who's going to pick up the check? All that kind of stuff. We're going to talk about some rules of etiquette, at least from our perspective, when you're talking about money with friends and family. So we will talk to you next week. This is Dave Hagen, and you've been listening to the Financial Wellness Podcast. You've been listening to the Financial Wellness Podcast, Dave's weekly message to keep you on your path to financial success. If you have a question that you would like Dave to answer on the podcast, go to thefinancialwellnesspodcast.com. You can leave an audio message with one click of a button or type your message into the question box. Either way, it's sent right to Dave's phone. Remember, Dave will randomly draw from the submitted questions and pick the winner of a free one-hour personal conversation with Dave to help you achieve your financial goals. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you receive the new episode notifications or share the podcast via the app with your family and friends. This is your announcer, Nick Appel, wishing you every financial success.